Okay, everyone. There's nothing new here. This is what we know and love from before, but just to remind you, I'll put it up each day to no one forgets. Okay. No, you the photograph being taken. So our first order of business is we have the first homework up. So this is so let me, let me tell you how this thing works. So this is, you're going to listen to a podcast, and then you're going to write a one-page essay about that podcast, about a particular question about the podcast. And in particular, it's going to be, what's the difference between bribery and extortion, if there is any? Right, so you'll have to come up, listen to the podcast about that kind of thing, and then try to think about that. Is there a difference? Isn't there a difference? What makes us have different words for them? Um, in what sense is it, is there any meaningful sense that they're different or, or isn't there? Um, and argue your case in one page, right? Then you will write this, you will not attach your name to it, and then you will submit it to an online system which will, which will attach you to, to it. Then after everyone's submitted theirs, you'll come back and everyone else will come back and read three of the other students' essays and comment on those essays. So. You will get full credit for participating in this, that is doing both parts, submitting an essay and reviewing other people's work. They are not grading your work, but they are commenting on your work. How can you make it better? What parts worked well? What parts didn't work well? Um, there's sort of two charms for, of this. I, 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 it annoys me. Like it's, it's like a whole rigmarole for me. It's a whole rigmarole for you in the sense that some people will have computer problems, et cetera, et cetera. But people have commented to me that it can be very good, so we're, we're keeping it just because it can be very good. Not everyone gets a lot out of it, but some people get quite a lot out of it. And the things they get out of it, first you get to write an actual essay, right? arguing a point. You're going to take a point, take a position, then you're going to argue it in one page. Um, then you get the experience of reading other people's essays as a teacher or as a, a reader and like commenting, what's good about this, what's bad about this, and seeing what other people are doing. And some people saying, say, look, I thought I wrote a really good essay, and then I read that other person's, and that was so much better. Right? And, and that's helpful in terms of learning how to, to write, which is super important for life, and, and learning sort of how lecturers look at your work, because you'll be in that position yourself. I mean, then, of course, you get comments from other people. Some, of course, will be more helpful than others, but hopefully some of them are helpful. Okay? Um, the really big benefit here, though, is the looking at other people's work, I, I think. But, you know, your mileage will vary. So, how is this thing going to work? Let me... Okay, this is doing all kinds of weird things. Z is connecting over here, which is fun. Okay. Let's move over here. An unknown error occurred, as it does. Are we up? Yeah, we're up. Okay, so how is this thing going to work? Because it's a little weird. So here we are in our, in our lovely Brightspace page. We go up to My Learning. You will notice that we have last year's slides, of course. We have the assignments, and we have some old exams up now. Um, and if we go into Assignment, we have this one assignment the bribery versus extortion assignment. There's a bit of explanation on how this thing works. Um, most importantly, when you're doing this, don't use the Safari web browser. People who use the Safari web browser often have problems with it. For some reason, the system doesn't like Safari. So Firefox, Chrome, whatever it is that you like. Not Edge. Well, you can use Edge if you want. I don't know what's wrong with you. But you can, you can do that. But don't use Safari for this particular thing because just the system doesn't like it. Okay. And, whoop, wrong, wrong mouse, you'll go in here, and it will load in this thing. Yours will probably look a little different from mine because I'm in teacher mode and I don't, it doesn't really have a good student viewing mode. But the important thing is, up here on the left, there's these activities, and the activity that we're interested in here is assignment one. All right, so you see it here, you click that, it opens up assignment one, possibly, yeah, there it is. Um, and it's going to look a bit different from, for you. It won't look like this, but, 
But once you click that assignment one, it'll give you the opportunity to either paste in your essay, so you can do it in text, or you can upload it in Word or, or, in, um, or in PDF. Do not upload it in pages if you're a Mac user. I know people, people use pages and it's great for Mac users, but people are gonna have to read this. Other students are gonna have to read this and if they don't have a Mac, they can't read pages. So Word, PDF, or text. Okay. Put it up in that. And then you need to do that by, it says it down here, October 9th at midnight. You upload your, your thing by then. And then after that, it will give you three other students' things. You'll come back in here, and you'll click on those, and there'll be a series of questions about those. So it'll be, you know, does it look like it's their own work? Does it look like they read the thing? I mean, listen to the podcast. Does it, um, you can see that you can click on the podcast there. Um, what, what worked well in their essay? What worked poorly that they could do better? These sorts of questions. And that won't take a super amount of time, but I think it's very useful. And you'll do three of those. If you participate in the thing, you'll get full credit. If you don't, you don't. If you don't submit a paper, you can't participate in the second half where you're evaluating others. There's no fair like just being a critic but not submitting yourself. That's not right. right? So you have to participate in the first part to be able to do the second part. Okay. Questions about this? The podcast isn't super long. I think it's like 20 minutes. You can listen to it on the bus or whatever. It's, 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 it's I don't know, fairly easy listening for, for, for some. This American Life, you've, you've heard them before, right? Mr. Glass. Hi. Right. Oh. Any questions? Yeah. When you say participate in the full marks, does that put both the essay and the Yeah, yeah. If you only did the essay but you didn't mark anyone, you'd only get half points. Yeah. Okay. Now, at your sign three. I think it's actually up at two at the moment. I'm going to change it to three. Yeah, there's two peers at the moment, but I'll change it to three. You're assigned three. Most of you will have three people read yours, but some people won't because obviously there's going to be some people who don't do the second part for whatever reason. So you know, don't, don't worry if you only see two at that stage. It, it's fine. But you, sh you should do three to get the full credit. Okay. Okay. Again, don't put your name or anything on the first bit so that no one knows who you are. And right, so they're, they, it's anonymous from their point of view. When you're reading other people's, you won't know who they are. Um, but be nice. You know, it's, it's, just because it's the internet and you're anonymous doesn't mean you can be a jerk. And, and you're not really anonymous, of course. Like if someone was really abusive or something, I could find out who they were and we could sort it out. But haven't had that problem, but, but the potential is there. I, I, I don't think we'll have any troubles like that. Like we never have before, but you know. Um, yeah, people are generally nice. It's going to be fine. <laughs> okay, people with me here? Okay, so you have till the 9th, and then you'll have until when? Does it say? It says begin. So when do we have for the second bit? So the first bit ends at the 9th, end of the day, midnight and the 9th, and the second bit ends on the 15th. Okay. And there's a third bit, there's a reflect phase where you're supposed to go in and say, hey, what did I learn? We don't care about that. You don't have to do that. You can if you want. It's fine. But I think people naturally are curious what people said about their essay. I don't think I have to prompt you to care about what people said about your essay. I think that's fine. Okay. So you can ignore reflect. You can do it if you like. It, it doesn't matter. OK. And now here's the part where I try very hard to actually log out from this thing because we even it logged in on a public computer is just asking for trouble, is it not? Stop recording, and we'll be happy. Okay. Okay. I had a clicky thing at one point. Uh, here we go. We'll see what happens. OK, so that's the exam. It's on the 18th. In the meantime, you'll be doing the assignment. I don't think it'll take you a super a lot of time to do the assignment. It'll take, you know, you'll have to listen to the podcast. You'll have to write an essay, which takes a while. Like it's, it's not 
It's not nothing writing a one-page essay, but you don't have to go on and on and on. It's not, you don't have to write a book, but you have to have an opinion, and you have to support your opinion. Um, and then the reviewing other people's work doesn't take very much time at all, so that's not a big deal, but you do have to do it. Okay. 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 So now we're going to do, uh, in terms of what's on the exam, what's on the exam is everything up to and including today. So today is the last day where we have information that's going to be on this exam. We will do new stuff next week, but it won't be on this exam. It'll be on the final exam, and you can be pretty certain the stuff we're doing next week is going to be on the final exam because it's my favorite stuff in the whole course. So um, it's hard to stop me, but it won't be on this exam because you need a week to, to sort of settle into the material and figure out what your questions are, come back and ask them and all of that. Right? So, okay. But this stuff, this stuff today could be on the exam. All right. So we have this, this, this idea that if we just had two, two parties and we had um, single peak preferences, they would naturally go to the middle. They would compete to the middle. They would both be at the median voter. But in spite of the way we like to talk about right and left, this idea that there's only one policy dimension is a little bit silly. Right? There's lots of things that come up for discussion. Even if you've got two you know, kind of left-wing guys, some people want 40% taxes, some people want 60% taxes, you know, and they want, I want the, the money to go to, that, that we raise in taxes to go to hospitals, I want it to go to the poor, right? And there's different views on these things, even in like one policy dimension. So when we think about lots of different policies, it's not clear that this applies. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this same sort of model with single peak preferences, but we're going to have more than one policy. Okay? And in particular, we're doing this for a couple of reasons. We're doing it, one, because you know, this, this obsession with one policy is a little ridiculous, and two, because it's leading into something that we're going to be doing starting next week. So it gives the same sort of graphs, and we get the, the, the same sort of argument going on. So we're going to look at the same model. You're going to have two, two politicians deciding where to locate. And we're going to have some voters, but they're going to have two policies that they care about. So our voters are still going to have single peak preferences, but they're going to have single peak preferences in each thing. Right? So we have one policy, which is what, what rate of tax that we should have. And we have another policy, which is how much of that tax, what percentage of that tax should go to attracting new business to Ireland versus how much of that tax should go to helping out the poor. Right? And we have a decision to make. Right? Do we want to be focused on growth, maybe at the expense of the poor, maybe helping out the rich, but, but more, more, more income for the country? Or do we want to help out the poor because life is hard for them and, and you know, it could be us? Right? So these are two policy dimensions. How much do we want to tax, and how do we want to divide up those taxes? And you can think of loads and loads of things you know, that, that governments make decisions on, and clearly there's more than one. Right? Right. So for each of these, we could, if we wanted to, draw it the same way. This could be policy one. And we could have our guys that have their single peak preferences. We have policy two. And we got our guys. Maybe that's the same guy who has single peak preferences. Right. And these are, we're going to think about them as totally separate policies. They're not particularly necessarily related. There are just two separate policies, and we got guys that are, have preferences. So this little guy X, he likes kind of a, a low policy for policy one, and he likes kind of a high policy for policy two. Right? But there could be some other guy, let me do him in black, that liked a low policy for, uh, that's not black. That's not how black works at all. Low policy for policy one and a low policy for policy two. They don't have to be related in any way. Right? So this guy likes a low policy in both, and this guy likes low for one and high for two, and they could be any old, old way. Right? 
completely unrelated policies. Are you with me here? All right. Now, they're unrelated, except that we're going to have these politicians who have to run on a platform. And they have to say, here's what I'm offering in policy one, and here's what I'm offering in policy two. Right? So even though they're unrelated, these guys in the end are going to have to pick between two politicians. And those politicians are going to be offering a package of policies. They'll be offering, say, low policy in both, or high policy in both, or low in one, high in the other, medium in each, or whatever. Right? But you can't just pick and choose each policy individually because we only have two politicians. Right? So it's not two politicians going in policy one, two politicians going in policy two. They're the same guys. Right? And so they're, they're picking a package of, of policies. Okay? And so it is going to be helpful that instead of drawing it individual policies, that we sort of put them together into a policy space. And we love that the jargon. Oh, like science fiction jargon is the best. So policy space. And this is going to look very much like the Edgeworth box, which is why we sort of had our, our side into to the Edgeworth box. Right, so I got a box like this. In this case, it's square because we put each policy on 0, 1. On the x-axis, we have policy 1 that runs from 0 to 1. And on the y-axis, we have policy 2 which runs from 0 to 1. This is very much like when we had x1 and x2 in, in microeconomics, right? And we just said that these are the two goods. They could be totally unrelated goods, but we're going to look at all the packages of goods that you could get. The only difference is, is that with goods, you could have an infinite amount, and so the, the graph just went off forever. Here, we have a limit to the policy of 1. We've just sort of defined 1 as our, our highest possible policy. And so it gets bounded at the top and at, at the right. But otherwise, it's just like x1 and x2, right? policy 1, x, policy 2. All right, so our first thing we want to do is we want to talk about what people's preferences look like in this environment. So I'm going to put our guy, if I can do the same guy, our red guy. This red guy is interesting. I'm going to graph our red guy here. He wants a low policy 1 for his ideal, and he wants a high policy 2 for his ideal. Okay, so let me put him on. He wants a low policy 1. Right? Did I get that right? Let me, let me get that right. Low policy 1, high policy 2. So he wants a low policy 1. That's his ideal policy 1. And he wants a high policy 2. That's his ideal policy 2. So his ideal package of these two would be, we either take it up here, take it up here. That's his ideal package. That is his bliss point. If he could find and elect a politician that had exactly these policies, he could not get any happier in politics than that. Okay? And anything else is going to be worse. Right? He's going to have the wrong amount of policy one, he's going to have the wrong amount of policy two. Right. All right. Right. So moving in any direction, moving in that direction is worse. 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 Everything is worse. Now, ideally, we'd be at the red dot. We'll see what he gets, but that, that's what he would like. Right? People with me? Okay. Hi. I shall re redraw this because it's messy enough. Okay, and we got, got our guy up here with his bliss point. Now, what I want to do is I want to draw this guy's indifference curves. What do these indifference curves look like? Right, because that's how we sort of represent his preferences. It's not enough to know his ideal point. We need to know how he trades off one thing against each other as we go along. Right? So what, does his, what do his preferences look like? Well, we'll start out with the easy one. See? The way you construct an indifference curve is you start at any random point, and then you just see that gives him some happiness or sadness, and then you change things, and you try to keep him equally happy as he was before. So let's start out with the easy bit, which is down here. 
Let's take this point as our starting point. Okay. Ideally, he'd be at the red point, but suppose instead we're at the green point. Okay. And now I want to track out his indifference curves. So the first thing I do is I do something nice for this guy. Well, what could I do? He is, if we put in policy one and two, one, policy two. He has less policy one that he wants, right? The red is his ideal, so he's got less policy one than he wants. And he's got less policy two that he wants. So I want to do something nice for him. And so I'll give him more policy one. Let's move him in this direction. And I see his little face lights up. He's such a happy boy. Okay? That's great, but I don't want to make him happy. I want to make him just as miserable as he was to begin with. And so now I have to do something bad to him. And so I have to move him with policy two. I have to move him away from his bliss point. Right? So I move him in this direction. That makes him sad. And I keep moving him up till the point where, where he has the same happiness he had before. Okay? And we can keep doing this. And we get indifference curves that look something like this. Normal, everyday indifference curves. Right? And that's because at this green point that I started with, more of policy one was a good thing, and more of policy two was a good thing. Just like in microeconomics, we assumed that more of x1 was a good thing, more of x2 was a good thing. Right? So it's exactly the same argument that we did in, in microeconomics, because at this point, he's equally, uh, he, he wants more of both. Okay. Okay. But we could have started him somewhere like this, where he has too much policy one, but not enough policy two. Right, so we start out and we say, let's do something nice for this guy. And doing something nice for him means giving him less policy one, because he's got too much. It's too high. So we want something more, more left wing. Yeah, we can give him left wing, no problem. So we move him in this direction, and that makes him happy. And then, of course, we have to make him sad with policy two so that he goes back to the same happiness he had before. And so we need to move farther away from the bliss point. We need to take away, util take away policy two from him. All right, so we move in this direction. That makes him sad. And we get a new point here. And if we connect all these up, it looks like that. Okay. We can do the same thing out here, as you might imagine. We start out at a point like that. And we start out. He's got, now he's got too much of policy one. He's got too much of policy two. So we start out doing something nice for him. Doing something nice for him is to give him less policy one. That makes him happy. Now we have to do something bad for him. Well, he's got too much policy two, so we need to add more. Right? And that'll make him less happy. Because we've made him happy by reducing policy one. Now we've got to make him sad, so we increase policy two, because he's got too much of it. And so we move up in this direction, and that makes him sad. So if we trace this out, it's going to look something like this. And you can see there's a circle coming up, right? You, you with me there? Okay. We'll do one more, well, because why not? Why not? Okay. We could be over here. He's got not enough policy one. He's got too much policy two. So we start out, we do something nice for him. Well, doing something nice means giving him more policy one. Right? That makes him happy. Then we have to do something bad to him to balance it out. And so he's got too much policy two. We give him more. That makes him sad. And we move up in this direction. That's sad. And we get indifference curves that look something like that. So that whole circle is an indifference curve. Everywhere along that circle, he gets equal happiness. Right? So if we draw this out, we've got our guy with his bliss point. And then we've got, we can start at any other point and there's going to be an indifference curve going through that point. right? So it's going to look, if we start here like we did, we're going to get an indifference curve that looks something like that. 
If we start farther out, we're going to get an indifference curve that looks something like that. If we start farther out, get an indifference curve that looks something like that, and so on. And moving in is better. Because right, so this guy's goal is to get to his bliss point if he possibly can. And the more inside, the more inner indifference curve we can get on, the happier he's going to be. Right? Before, in micro, it was always let's get on the highest indifference curve we can because that was better. Here we want to get into the most central indifference curve that we possibly can. Okay. Just as an aside, if we were really honest about, like, if we, not honest, like, or dishonest, but if, if we really wanted to give a full sense of utility for goods, we would draw indifference curves this way as well, right? Because it's very nice to have milk. Having two tons of milk that you're not allowed to sell and it's all in your kitchen and you have to walk around your kitchen becomes a problem, right? You can have too much of anything given that you can't sell it. Like, if you could sell it, it'd be great. But if you can't sell it and it's just rotting in your kitchen, you can have too much milk. So it's the same thing. There's some ideal amount of milk that you get, some ideal amount of eggs that you get, and then you've got indifference curves that are, are like this around it for everything. Which is why, and this is, this is probably a, a deep, deep thought, but this is why Bill Gates doesn't buy up all the world's milk, because he just doesn't want that much milk. Yeah? This is totally arbitrary. It's his personal tastes. And it was because I'm trying to match this particular red guy that I arbitrarily drew down. Right, so this arbitrary guy had low ideal policy one and high ideal policy two. It could have been anything else, completely arbitrary. It's just what he cares for. And so when we draw this guy in, I want his ideal point to have low policy one and high policy two to match that. But it could have been somebody that wanted high policy one and low policy two, or wanted both policies to be high. The bliss point can be anywhere. It's just the guy's particular taste. Yeah, yeah, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. But wherever it is, there's gonna be these concentral, concentric circles around it. Now, of course, we don't really normally do that when we're talking about microeconomics. And the reason is because we can just take it as read that, that Bill isn't going to buy so much milk that he just has it rotting in his fridge or all around his house. He's not going to surround himself by 300,000 tons of rotting eggs. He's just not. He's going to say, I got enough. Let me buy something else instead, right? And so in, in micro, you never really, for most things, end up with more than you want because you're buying the stuff. So why buy more than you want? That's ridiculous. And so we can just ignore that and look at sort of this, this area where you don't have as much as you want because that's the only really relevant area. This stuff up here, while it might exist if we forced you to take too much milk, that's not the economy we live in. We live in an economy where people go out and buy their own milk, and so they don't buy that much. And so we can just ignore that, and then our graph becomes simpler. But if we were really giving a complete description of people's tastes, very often we would get these concentric circles in, in micro as well. Okay, so there we go. We've got our guys. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we know what an individual person's utility looks like. Now we can talk about how politicians are going to react to this, what they're going to, going to do in response to this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the same thing again, as you might have guessed. Just like this, we got our policy one, we got our policy two. But now we're going to put some voters on, right? And we need more than one voter because you can't really tell a story with one voter. You just give him what he wants and he's happy, right? We need at least three voters to have a story about voting, right? And more is going to be complicated. Three, you will see, is plenty complicated enough. So we're going to put three voters down here and let them choose between two politicians. Right. So let me put three, three voters down. And the way I'm going to draw them, okay, one guy in black here. I'll do one guy in blue up here and one guy in green 
down here. Okay? Those are their bliss points. And of course, they got concentric circles of, of, of indifference curves going out. Now, importantly, I put them in a triangle. Things are different if they happen to be in an exact straight line. But I put them in a triangle, which seems reasonable, like this exact straight line seems pretty special. But there could be reasons for it, right? So if the, if the policies were very natural, naturally related in some way, that they kind of had to go, go together, then you would naturally think of it as a straight line. And then you could think about it that really comes down to just one policy. Where do you want to be on that line? Right? But mostly triangle is, is capturing what we're, we're looking for. Like People have all kinds of different beliefs and, and desires and goals for society. And, and so, yeah. And a triangle doesn't seem, at least to me, unreasonable, but you can you know, obviously think for yourself. Okay. So now we got these guys, and they've got their indifference curves. And we have two politicians that have to decide where to locate, right? what policies to offer these three guys. And I say, well, how do we think about that? Now, obviously, we're going to start out by thinking about this and say, these guys are going to vote for whoever gives them higher utility. We're going to have them very, very, very naive voting. Just going to, whoever gives me higher, you know, offers me a package of policies that makes me happier, that's the guy I'm going to vote for. Okay. That seems like a reasonable economics -y sort of start, does it not? Like, uh, yeah, that, this is not helpful. But we're going to do that. And so, we could just start plopping these guys down at random, but it's going to be helpful if we start by thinking about, well, in order to win, I need to get two of these voters to vote for me. Right? If I can get two voters to vote for me, I win. And screw the other guy. Right? It's, it's, uh, I'd love him to love me, but you, know, you can't please all the people all the time. If I can get two people to vote for me, I win. Right? And so that's going to be my goal as a politician, to be more attractive <laughs> to two of the guys than the other politician is. Okay? And so I can start thinking about how do we compare these guys like two by two. So let me just think about, for example, these guys, the black guy and the green guy. Okay? Let's sort of look at if I decided as a politician that I want to please those guys and I'm going for their votes and the heck with, with the blue guy. Right? I'm just going for those two guys. What should I offer to get those two guys? Okay. And the first thing that we want to notice is that we are going to want to be on the contract curve. Yeah, remember this was last time in the Edgeworth thing, right? There was a contract curve thing where the indifference curves were just tangent. That's what we're going to want. So suppose, for example, that I offered politician A is here. Okay. That, that's what, what I, what I, the policies that I offer as politician A. Okay. Well, these guys have an indifference curve that goes through there. So let me, in black, draw the black guy's indifference curve, something like that, a concentric circle. And let me draw the green guy's indifference curve. It's going to be something like that, a concentric circle. That's very tan. Shouldn't be tan, it should be green. Looking something like that, actually. I'm going to circle around. Okay? So politician A. And he's wanting to go for the black and the, the green guy. Okay? Well, if I'm targeting those two as my constituents, I want them to vote for me, I haven't done as good as I could. I haven't made them as happy as I could make them. Right? And I want to make them so happy that they don't go for the other politician, wherever he's located. So if I'm going for these two guys, I have left a lot of value on the table. Because if we put it in, all of this area is better for both guys. So by moving to A, 
I have not made these guys as happy as I could. I could make both of them happier by just moving into that red area. Right. This was just like we had in the Edgeworth box where there was gains from trade. Right? When we had this area between the indifference curves where the indifference curves were crossing, then that gave us an opportunity to swap between each other and make both of us better off. Now, th these guys can't swap. Right? It's not like our, 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 guy, our black guy and our green guy can swap policies to, to trade, but they're being offered policies by the politicians. And this politician, if he's targeting these two voters to be his constituents, the guys that, that, that elect him, he's going to not want to leave all this value on the table because he's competing against the other politician. So that's, you know, if, if you're competing against the other guy, you would want to make your voters as happy as you possibly could so that it's harder for the other guy to compete against you. Right. So he's not on the contract curve. So he could both the black guy and the green guy better off. What that means is that this guy, given that you're targeting two voters, you're always going to put yourself on the contract curve between those voters. Right? Because that way, you're making them as happy as you can without hurting the other one. There's no, no need to, to leave it where they could both be better off, and you don't make them that way. Right? So we, I will do my best to make it similar. The black guy, the green guy, and I believe it was the blue guy. The blue guy was up here somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on the contract curve between these two guys. So let me in, I don't know. Can you even read that? Yeah, yeah, more or less you can read that. So all those points on the contract curve, it doesn't have to be a straight line. It can be a wobbly thing. But they have this feature that the indifference for curve for guy, the black guy, and the indifference curve for the green guy are, well, are just tangent on that curve, like so. Or if we picked a different point on the curve, it would look like Every place on the contract curve has those guys as indifference curves, just tangent to each other. Okay? There's no reason to go, if, if we're targeting those two guys as the guys who are going to vote for us, there's no point going off the contract curve. Are okay, people with me here? If we go off the contract curve, we're making both of them sadder. Why? OK. But. That's just between those two guys, right? This is assuming guy A is targeting the black and the green as the two who will vote for him. But he could have been targeting the black and the blue to vote for him. Or he could have been targeting the blue and the green to vote for him. He just needs two, right? So there's actually three contract curves that we're going to care about. I can do it again. Get the black guy, the green guy. And the blue guy, we'll do our contract curves. There's a contract curve there, there's a contract curve there, and there's a contract curve there. Right? If we're on this one, the black and the green guys' indifference curves are both tangent to each other. If we're on this one, the black and the blue guys' indifference curves are just tangent to each other. And if we're on this one, the green and the, and the blue guys are just tangent to each other. Or the other ones we do, whatever. So I can target any two of these guys. Okay? But <clears throat> there's no reason for any politician to ever move off one of those contract curves. Now, you can imagine that if we had 1,000 voters, 
then it would be, what, a thousand, the permutations of a thousand, take it, thousand things taken two at a time. Whatever. That's a lot of contract curves going all, all sorts of ways. But we can see what's going on with, with just three guys. So that gives us three possible contract curves that you're going to locate on. Okay, people with me here? Punchline here is that we have the two politicians. They're both going to locate on one of those contract curves. Okay, there's no point being off the contract curve. That just makes it easier for the other guy to win. Right, so we're going to put them on the contract curves. And now <clears throat> I want to show that there is no Nash equilibrium, technically no pure strategy Nash equilibrium of these guys. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out and just say, let's put politician A somewhere on one of those contract curves. Okay? We know they have to be on the contract curve. So let me arbitrarily put them on the contract curve. So let me put him here. That's a happy little place. Hey, I put him there. All right. Well, what does this mean? He is clearly targeting the black and the blue guy to come vote for him. And I'll screw this guy. It'd be nice if he did vote for me, but what can you do? Probably I'll lose him to the other guy. But I'm targeting these two. And I've picked a place on the contract curve. Now, I, I could move farther up this way, in which case the black guy likes me less, but the blue guy likes me more. Or I could move farther this way, in which case the black guy likes me more, but the blue guy likes me less. But here, at least, I'm not like in a position where they could both like me better. Like If I was out here, I could make them both like me better by moving to A. So I moved to A. I'm on the contract curve. Okay, That's great. What does B do? What's his best response? Well, let's look at how happy we've made these guys. Right? Let's, let's draw in their indifference curve. So let me start out drawing in the black indifference curve. Looks something like that. And then the blue indifference curve. It's going to be just tangent, clearly. Something like that. And then the green indifference curve is going to look something like that. Now, that's a bit messy. The important thing to notice is that we're on this contract curve, so the blue and the black guys have got to be tangent. But the green guy's indifference curve, first of all, it's way the heck out away from his, his bliss point. But it doesn't have to be tangent at all, because we're not on his contract curve at all. Right? We're just screwing that guy over. We're, we're trying to, to cater to the black and the blue guy and screw the green guy. Right? So we've catered to the black and the blue. There's a trade-off between them, but we've done the best we can. And <coughs> now we need to, th then the green guy gets what he gets, which is not much, right? Well, hey, well, what happens now? Now B decides where should I go? Given that A is choosing this point, what's the best thing for me to do? Well, all he needs to do is to get two guys to vote for him, right? And so what he can do is he can move anywhere between the blue and the green line, moving in this direction is better for blue. Moving in this direction is better for green. So if I go, for example, over here, I've made both of them better off. Right? So by moving Both of them are better off. So if guy A is going there, I would prefer to go there, and they'll both be on more inner indifference curves. They'll both be better off. Okay. Well, that's great. But notice that I just started with any arbitrary place for A. I put him on the, the, the contract curve, because otherwise it's just a waste. But other than that, I picked an arbitrary place on the contract curve. He was going for two voters. It always left room for the other guy to pick off one of his voters. So he said, so he said I'm, I'm picking a particular spot on this contract curve. And this spot is pretty favorable to A and not super favorable, to, um, not pretty favorable to black, but not super fav favorable to blue. It's pretty far down. 
which left opportunity for the other guy to say, hey, hey, Blue, he's going for you, but he's not trying that hard. You know, come over here, come over here, and I'll give you this policy, which isn't ideal for you or anything, but it is better for you, and it's also better for Green, and now I got two people voting for me. And just to sort of to fix this, we, now that we have that, of course, we could draw in indifference curves there, and it would be possible for A to pick them off. Let me do that. Black, we got blue, we got green, we got contract curves between them. And now we've got B somewhere over here. And A was over here and he got screwed, right? And so now A is gonna say, well, how can I get some voters out of this? So what we do is we draw in the indifference curves. We got greens look something like that. Blues are just tangent there, something like that. And of course, black, getting screwed in this whole thing, something like that. Those are the indifference curves. Right, and now, the black, now guy A says, well, is there any way that I can, can steal some voters from these guys? Well, how could I do it? I could go in here. Right? If I went in, in this area, I would make the green guy and the black guy better off. Or I could go in here, and I would make the blue guy and the black guy better off. So I got two ways to go. I can either go into that area, or I can go into this area. Either way, I'm going to pick off some of your voters. Right? So if, uh, let's say I'm thinking about this. I, well, we've really screwed the black guy, who is my main constituent. And we've helped out the blue guy a little bit. Now I can say, OK, well, okay let's move over here. And I'll make things even better for you, blue. And, and you won't be screwed quite as badly, black. And now we're again back on our our contract curve, but now we have it so that we're giving a lot, we're way up towards blue's area, right? So it's, it's very favorable to blue and not so favorable to black, but we would steal voters from guy B. Or we could move down here, go onto this contract curve, or even in this case, onto this bit of the contract curve. But let's say we go down here and we're going for the black voter and the green voter. And there we're saying, okay, screw the blue guy. Let's just go for these two and we can make them both better off. And this is all I've been putting down to kind of arbitrary points. And so clearly, you could do this for any point on the contract curve, right? Um, it's even easier to see if we make it like really right here, right, right, right at the end, and just go anywhere on this other contract curve, you made two people better off. So wherever we put one of the guys, the other guy can steal his voters, or at least can steal one of his voters, which means there's gonna be no pure strategy equilibrium. There's gonna be no point where both of them, I'm going here, you're going here, this is the best we can do. Right? It's always going to be this churning. You go there, so I go here. So then, then you go somewhere else, and I go somewhere else, and we keep moving around. Um, which suggests that this, this um, downs thing, where we all move to the center, is really a figment of just having one policy that we're talking about. And this may be one of the reasons why there's so much effort put into saying it's a left-right thing. Right? Well, kind of, life is more complicated than left and right, but we, we want to think about it in terms of left and right. If there's left and right, everything settles down. We move to the median voter with only two, two, two politicians. But if we have more than two politicians, if we have more than one policy, there is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. There's no stable thing. So we would expect policies to be changing over time. Okay. Yes, I will leave it there. And that's everything that's on the exam. Um, and we'll, we'll continue stuff next week, but it won't be on this exam. Right.